who should be mayor of Kansas City. Our trash pickup is Friday. This is Sunday. We'll see what day it's picked up this week. This but is unacceptable. There's your bulky There's discussion. It's funny how quickly you see all the problems in a, just in one block. See the candidates in a whole new way as they accept KCPT's invitation to tour a distressed neighborhood with two frustrated citizens. Plus, are Jolie Justice and Quentin Lucas really as similar as the pundits make out? This hour, you get to decide as the two mayoral hopefuls join us for the final debate. Who Will Lead KC is funded in part by the Health Forward Foundation. Additional community support comes from the law firm of Hush Blackwell, the AARP, and Bob and Marlise Gourley. And now, here's your moderator, Nick Haynes. It's the final countdown. Election day is Tuesday, and if you're still confused, befuddled, totally undecided, we have you back. Welcome to the final debate, and get ready for something completely different. We've not only thrown open the doors to invite as many citizens as we could pack into the KCPT studios, we're also throwing out all the usual debate rules, no long opening and closing statements, no time limits so we can get to the heart of the matter. Are you ready? Let's meet the candidates. Please welcome Quinton Lucas and Jolie Justice. Thank you. Thank you for being. This is the 3,795th <laughs> yes, debate of this season, and we are very grateful that you've taken the time to be with us. You're both members of the City Council, both uh, are obviously attorneys as well, and that's led some to believe there's really not that much difference between you. And in fact, I got this email from a gentleman by the name of Bill who says, I am not coming to your debate, and I'm probably not going to vote. They are two peas in a pod. I have no faith they're going to change anything. Now, thanks, Bill, for making us clear about where you stand on this. But, Quinton Lucas, is Bill expressing a feeling that many people have in the city that you are both the same? How would Kansas City under Mayor Quinton Lucas be any different than if it's Mayor Jolie Justice in that job? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me today, and thank you for all of the audience being here. I have great respect for Councilwoman Justice, her public service, and her legal practice for a number of years. But I think there are a few key differences about how we would approach things. Instead of conversations, I've taken action on a number of key issues. Economic incentive reform, finding funding for housing, $500,000 a year for minor home rehab, making sure we're talking about and working on really improving the east side long term. And there's a different life story with us. I grew up in East Kansas City. I still live there, have family there. It's something I care about in bridging east and west, north and south of the river, have been things I've been doing for four years and look forward to doing for four more. We have one in five people in Kansas City, according to the latest poll, Jolie Justice, who have absolutely no, uh, they don't know who to vote for. They're completely undecided. What is the biggest difference between you and Quentin Lucas? You know, I think when you, you look at the differences between the two of us, one of the things that people are kind of stepping forward and saying about me is you've got a proven track record. You have been someone that for the last 13 years, both as a city council person and as a state senator, has actually gone out into the community and um, met face to face with folks who are having everyday problems and come up with solutions and then followed through till they're done. And that's something that I'm really, really proud of. This track record of not just talk, but actually accomplishments. And, and it goes back to the time in the state senate when I was passing laws that are helping clean up vacant and abandoned properties, protect domestic violence victims, substance of criminal justice reform, and then of course on the council, taking on big issues and small issues and making sure that I see them through to completion, no matter how hard it is. While some people are still weighing you two up, most people have formed an opinion right now, a concrete impression of our current mayor after eight year, years, Sly James. How would your style of leadership, Jolie Justice, be different than his? I think one of the things that um, people say about me is that I'm a collaborator, that I sit down and I bring everybody into the room, no matter how polarizing the voices. I've actually been accused of having too many conversations, but the reality is, is you cannot do things without bringing every stakeholder to the table. And that's different than Mayor James. Mayor James had big ideas, and Mayor James pushed through with those ideas. And you know what? Our city is a better place because of it. But if we want to finish Kansas City's success story, we have to make sure that we are continuing to move forward but that 
success is felt in every single neighborhood. And so I'm the kind of person who brings together people, whether it's across the partisan divide in Jefferson City, or whether it's in the city council working with every single council member across every single district. I'm going to be that kind of person who not just collaborates, but comes up with policies and gets them passed. Okay, Quentin Lucas, we've got to know Sly James over eight years, whether you like him or not. How would you be different? You know, there are a few different ways. I think we've seen a lot of kind of big projects happen for a while, but we need more neighborhood wins. It can't just be home runs in Kansas City. And another thing that I think is key is that while it's important to get things done, you have to get things done right. We can't have messy processes with big infrastructure. We can't forget about long neglected neighborhoods. I think there are far too many people who live in neighborhoods like the one I'm from on the east side of Kansas City or south and north who will say, yeah, it's been cool to see downtown grow, but what about our neighborhoods? What about that vacant lot? What about the abandoned housing? I think my key different focus will be one that's always making sure we're equitable and making sure that we take care of basic services first, be trash, water, cleaning up houses, and that's what I want to take care of. Running for political office means you can be judged by others, and oftentimes in a very harsh way, of course. Both of you have been criticized in the campaign, and the storyline for you, Quentin Lucas, he doesn't stick to his word. He doesn't follow through on his promises. He says one thing and he does another. What can you say to convince us now that that's not an accurate portrait of you? Well, you know, first of all, I think that has been uh, perpetuated by hundreds of thousands of dollars of negative ads uh, that my opponent supporters have been putting out in mailers and text messages and television. I think my sure answer to that is it's just not true. If you look at issue after issue, whether it be the minimum wage, where I stood up and fought for it, got an ordinance passed on council to increase it, whether it be relating to economic incentive reform, where I brought institutions together, 14 school districts, the business community, and got something passed, or whether it be in housing, time and time again. I have led on issues time and time again. I've been able to get a council majority. And frankly, I think if we compare four years of records, I am exceedingly proud of what I've done and what I'll continue to do. Jody Justice, you face criticism of your own. A Kansas City Star editorial says you have not led but followed on the council, often silently. She's non-committal, too often answering questions with the promise to convene all stakeholders and have a conversation about X, Y, and Z, rather than offering uh, a fix. If that's not you, what can you say to voters in this last hour to change that impression? You know, one of the things that um, it's been very interesting to me as an elected official over the past 13 years is that um, I've been called someone who talks too much with too little action, someone whose ideas are too big, someone who um, collaborates too much, someone who only does things without talking to people first. The reality is, is that everybody has a different experience. And what I will tell you is this. Um, I have a proven track record of making sure that I follow through with things that I start. And it's not an easy process. One of the things that I learned very quickly when I was in Jefferson City is that in order to get things done, you have to drop assumptions about the people that you're working with. You have to make sure that you are standing up for the issues that are important for you. And you have to make sure that when it's time, you speak and you speak with a loud voice. And I have done that my entire career. And so I am very proud of it. I am very proud of the things I've been able to accomplish. I'm very proud of how I am different than my opponent. And I know that the people of Kansas City are looking for someone who has a balanced approach, who is able to not just collaborate, and, but also get things done. And, and I'm very proud of the fact that that's what I've been doing. We're going to get to some citizen questions in a moment, but here's a question you will never hear asked in any other debate. Former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, <laughs> now on the speaking circuit, by the way, says the true art of leadership is the ability to say no, not yes. What group, interest, or cause are you willing to say no to if you're elected mayor, Quinton Lucas? I think you have to be willing to say no to everyone. And sometimes the hardest bit is to say no to your friends. Uh, just this morning, I was at a meeting, a group by the name of Urban Summit, where there are folks that were asking about any number of issues, and there were times that I say, no, we can't actually use funding in this way for parking lots, for example, on Prospect Avenue. We need to use it for affordable housing instead. That's the sort of thing I've been able to do, and that's what I'll continue to do. Waddell and Reed, you might have seen in the news, one of the largest private employers in uh, Johnson County in Overland Park, now says they're looking to move their headquarters from Johnson County over onto the Missouri side a few miles. Would you be saying no to them if they're asking for city tax incentives if you're mayor? It depends on where they're moving and what type of project they're trying to build. If they're just going to move to a big gleaming office tower downtown or on the Country Club Plaza, I do not think we need incentives for that. If they're looking to actually help rebuild and really start a jumpstart redevelopment in a neighborhood that's been long overlooked, I'll talk to them about that. But core to it is all of our economic development needs to relate to equity.
Who are you willing to say no to, Jolie Justice? One of the things that I've learned, Nick, in, in my long time in office is that you have to let people down at a rate they can absorb which means I've been having to say no to a lot of people for a long time. And because of that, I have people all over the political, political spectrum, all over the city, who say, I'm supporting Jolie Justice, not necessarily because I agree with her vision or I agree with her politics, but because she's consistent and that we know she will always tell the truth and that she will tell us no when I need to say no. And so on a daily basis as a city council person, I've had to say no. I've had to say no to my friends. I've had to say no to developers. I've had to say no to folks who who have ideas that while they sound great, in practicality they don't work. So when I say I'm going to have a conversation, it's because I don't want to just say no. I want to figure out how we can get to maybe or yes with something that has a true public benefit. I want to say yes to our citizens who have taken the time to be with us today. Affordable housing has been one of the biggest issues in this entire campaign. That concerns Diane Charity. Would you mind standing for us, Diane? Certainly, uh, certainly uh, we know that about half of Kansas City are renters. You are one of those half of Kansas Cityans who are renting there rather than owning your own home. What's your question for the candidates? Well, and that's true, and I'm proud to be a, a, a candidate or be a, a renter. My question is acknowledging that uh, one, there are 42 legal evictions uh, per day, and those are just the legal ones in Jackson County, the majority being from Kansas City. What positive steps do you plan to take to intercede earlier in the process to help Kansas City tenants avoid appearing in eviction court in the first place? Thank you, Diane. Jody Justice. You know, this issue is critical, and you are correct, that we um, have an increasingly alarmingly high rate of evictions, and we've not seen improvement over the years. And so I have some very specific things that not only do I propose, but things that I've been doing. I am a lawyer by trade. I provide free legal services to the community, and one of the things that we do is an adopt-a-neighborhood program. The Adopt-a-Neighborhood program provides free legal services to folks who are facing eviction or who could be on the path towards facing eviction. So one of the things that I would do is scale that up and make sure that there's no neighborhoods out there that are not adopted. The second thing is, is right now when people first interact with the eviction court, one of the problems we have is the access to free legal services. I have found time and time again when lawyers are available to help slow the process down that you can do things like avoid the eviction in the first place or come up with a resolution that will keep an eviction off a record. So I will provide specific funding to make sure that we're giving funding to groups like Legal Aid of Western Missouri and the Heartland Center for Jobs and Freedom so that they can provide free legal services to people facing eviction. You were on the council for four years. Why didn't you do those things then? You know, that is a fantastic question, Nick. And one of the things that we have to do is make sure that every time we see an opportunity to come up, um, that we keep it moving forward. As a member of the council, I have been providing free legal services. It's all been in the private sector. As a mayor, I'm going to be proposing to the city manager and to all of the council members that we move forward on a budget item that we fund it at the city level and not just at the private level. Knowing Quentin Lucas, I'm going to say you were on the council for four years. How are you going to answer Diane Charity's question? You know, I think there are a few different things we can do to address Diane's issue, and, and they're all important. First of all, we have a public defender system in America. It's not necessarily the greatest, but everybody charged with a crime of a certain level gets a lawyer. I'd like that for everyone dealing with an event. Eviction. If you go to court on the day of evictions, to the extent that people actually are showing up, they don't have counsel, they don't have that opportunity. That's something that the city can start funding through a housing <laughs> trust fund today. On the housing trust fund idea, I've actually gotten ordinances passed in connection with providing services in these very key areas. The only challenge right now is finding the money. And so what I want to be able to do over the next four years is to actually make sure, before we're talking about parking garages as funding priorities, or soccer fields as funding priorities, we're actually making sure we're filling in the housing trust fund to support people like this. And one last point. I think we need more assistance for people who are having trouble with rent before they're dealing with eviction services and making sure that we actually are giving them some stopgap so they don't have the high cost of moving, the high cost of an eviction. Ask many people what their biggest issue is in Kansas City, and it's crime. Fifth highest homicide rate in the country. Jessica Didell one of, uh, lost her son in 2016 to homicide on the streets of Kansas City, one of 131 people killed that year. Yes, um, my son was murdered on August 10th of 2016, and his uh, homicide still goes unsolved. Um, and then I lost an aunt this year um, to natural causes. He, my son left a daughter by the name of Layla, and she asked me, did the bad man get Aunt Lita? 
she um, did not understand that people die of natural causes. And I want to know what exactly can you guys do to work with groups like Mothers in Charge, Ad Hoc, and groups like that. I actually am a core mom with Mothers in Charge. What are you going to do in the community to ensure that my granddaughter doesn't grow up thinking that people die of um, homicides versus natural causes? Because there are other children okay. out there Great. with the same Quentin problem. Lucas. Yeah, two, first of all, uh, my condolences to you. I know um, that is difficult, and I know it's something that you continue to live with. And um, every year there are too many people in Kansas City that join you in that. A few key steps that we need to take to make sure we reduce tragedies. Um, I'll talk about policing in a minute, but, but one is actual trauma counseling, mentoring services. You know, one of the challenges with young people uh, who are homicide victims is that they have whole communities, whole communities of friends who are angry, who want retaliation, who often become more victims. We need to make sure that we're intervening. We need to make sure that we're giving counseling to those folks, 17, 18, young 20s, aged boys, and making sure that we're saying, no, you don't need to pick up a gun. You don't need to retaliate. You do have some pain. Last year, the city actually only gave $300,000 to the Aim for Peace program. We need to give more to long-term counseling services to make sure we're addressing those issues. In the Kansas City Police Department, we have a social worker program that's attempting to address that issue. They're not permanent employees. They're just on contract. We need to make that permanent. And then in connection with policing, we need to make sure there are fewer of these tragedies. How do we do that? Investing more in neighborhood policing, where we can build relationships with folks, where we can actually have officers that are there each day, seeing the drug house, seeing the issues that are happening, and intervening in advance. And then one final point is that detectives to solve these crimes is key. There are too many folks that are still walking around and have committed serious offenses in Kansas City. I want us to have a much better homicide clearance rate. Jody Justice. You know, one of the things that um, has really pained me the most as a city council person, as a member of this community, is the trauma that is inflicted across the entire community every time I hear a story like yours. And, and I just want you to know um, that all of us, both Councilman Lucas and I, and the people that are trying to make a difference in the city every day understand this, and this is our top priority. I will tell you that I feel like for years what we have done has not been the right approach, but I feel like over the last year and a half, we are starting to slowly move in the right direction on getting not just tough on crime, but smart on crime. I had a fantastic conversation the other day with our prosecutor, Jean Peters Baker, and one of the things she was talking about was the need to provide more social services out of her office as well. So she's enlisted the folks from ad hoc, and she's working with folks to make sure that we go out into the community and not just talk to the family members of victims of homicides, but to victims of gunshot wounds. Because someone who's been shot has the ability to come forward and talk about who shot them sometimes. But there's no trust there. And so one of the things that I will be focusing on is making sure that we are providing the social services that are necessary to get people to come forward and start to build trust. And we've started that with our police department and our social work program. I remember the first time I met Gina English. She was the very first social worker that we had on the police department. Part of what she was doing was working with families, um, working with victims to make sure that there was a trust being built. Now we've expanded that to um, social workers in all of our patrol divisions, but that's not enough. We have to make sure that we're continuing to provide wraparound case management services, not just for the victims of crime, but also for individuals who are the family members. And so those will be the things that I'll be focusing on. Thank you on. very much, Jolie Justice. Let's move to another issue now. Austin Williams is actually a stand-up comedian. <laughs> Lecturer <laughs> at, at UMKC, our hometown yeah. university. You have a question? Uh, yes. As an elder millennial, uh, I continue to see many of my friends with families opting to leave Kansas City for surrounding metropolitan areas as soon as their children are old enough to attend schools. As mayor, what would you do or say to convince specifically young families to stay in Kansas City? Jolie Justice, you got a solution? I do. So um, I would like to tell you first, as a Gen Xer, um, <laughs> the number of people I have tried to convince to stay in Kansas City over the course of my um, adult life has been tremendous. As a matter of fact, I remember when I first got out of school in the 90s, that was probably one of the toughest conversations I had because on a daily basis, I was losing friends, I was losing coworkers, I was losing folks all over the city. So what will I actually do? Well, number one, I will start to share the story 
of the success that we have in our public schools right now. Because one of the things that has been perpetuated is that our schools aren't performing. But guess what? We have a success story going on right now, just not in our city, but in our schools as well. We have 14 different school districts in Kansas City, Missouri. We have a Kansas City public school system right now that is thriving because of innovation, because of experiential living and learning, and because we are actually starting to increase all of those you know, benchmarks that we need in order to succeed. We have the ability right now to educate our kids in Kansas City, Missouri, and you're gonna hear from me um, as the mayor of Kansas City, uh, a cheerleader in chief, telling folks that this is the place where you wanna be because we have stable neighborhoods and quality education okay, opportunities. Quinton Lucas, how are you stopping people mm -hmm. fleeing to the suburbs if you become mayor? Well, you know, it's a significant challenge, and sometimes people think about it just in a southwest Kansas City or Brookside exodus type thing. You know, I represent the east side, where when we lose folks, we often end up with an abandoned or vacant house, a vacant lot thereafter, and all the issues that relate to it. So what do we need to do? I actually am going to go back to the public safety point. If you live in parts of East Kansas City or South Kansas City, there are lots of folks that say, I'm moving because I don't want to be around violence. I don't want my kid hearing gunshots like too many kids here. So step one is to continue to address the very core public safety issues that we were discussing before. Step two relates to making Kansas City more livable each day. That's taking care of basic infrastructure. That's making sure we're picking up trash. That's making sure we're eliminating illegal dumping that happens too much in certain neighborhoods of Kansas City. And then the third step really is working with educational institutions. And when I say work with them, it doesn't just mean go tell them what to do, like I think the city tried to do on the pre-K sales tax. It's instead doing something of saying, we want to let you be the leaders, but tell us how we can help. I want to make sure that as mayor, what I'm worried about is not what the child is learning at 2 p.m. in the classroom, but what's happening between 3 p.m. and 7 a.m. the next day, the stuff we can control. Are their parents getting evicted? Are they dealing with any number of other issues? Are there jobs in their neighborhood? Are there walkable neighborhoods? Those are the steps I think we can take to make sure Kansas City stays attractive for folks of all income levels, and they stay here to raise their families. Okay, we're going to get more questions in just a moment, but let's go to something completely different. We're heading out on location, so you can take a different take on these two people who want to be your mayor. Eight years ago, when Sly James and Mike Burke were campaigning for this prize, we invited them to take a tour of neglected neighborhoods with two frustrated citizens. That was the Marlborough neighborhood in South Kansas City. This time, we're going in the totally opposite direction. We're heading north, in fact, about five miles north of the Missouri River, just off I-35 on Antioch Road, where you'll find the Shamir neighborhood. Unfortunately, sometimes in the Northland, we feel like politicians think that there are no problems up here. You know, the city invests a lot of money in neighborhoods in the inner city, which they should. But I, I really believe that we have some of the same problems that the inner city neighborhoods have. We just maybe have them to a lesser degree. So tell me, what are the top probably three things that you've seen that have increased that are negatives for the neighborhood? Well, that is exactly where we're heading. <laughs> Excellent. So, top three, um, I would say increasing panhandling. Okay. In fact, it probably didn't even exist around here three years ago. Yeah, we had um, one, one person say that um, when they were stopped at the light, the panhandler tried to get in their car. Okay. Yes. We have a few that are unstable. You can just tell. There's some others that are really nice. It's just we keep getting more and more by the day, and we don't understand why. I've always thought, and it continues to need to be that access to mental health services. We're going to offer it to you. There's a better life than standing out here when it's 20 degrees outside. One of the things I talked about with one of the city engineers was doing some engineering type things. Is there a possibility that you could put um, something that's green or something that's, um, you know, green mixed with a, a hard infrastructure to make it more difficult to set up a permanent yeah, um, place to, to, yeah. to, to go to business there? Yeah. yeah. The second uh, thing that we've had a lot of um, issues with in the last few years is the homelessness. They were sleeping in the woods here. They sleep on the benches back here. There was one family that um, they had homeless sleeping in their backyard. I know, at least I think in our city code of ordinances, you can't just put up 50 people in your backyard and a whole yeah, bunch of extra structures, the, but the I guess. Poli well, there weren't permanent structures and right. they could say they were camping. There has to be some type of ordinance yeah. regarding long-term camping. That's something that uh, 
That's something we should be able to actually do pretty yeah. easily. You'd support an ordinance for that? I would. I'm somewhat shocked that it isn't already on the books, actually. Uh, I know. This is the very first time I have seen a homelessness issue on private property. Has this been reported to the city? They came out mm -hmm. and asked the homeowners about it, but since it is private property, mm -hmm. there was nothing they could do about it. You like that sign? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've seen a lot of Jolie Justice signs. It <laughs> makes me very happy. I see I need a yard sign up there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll drop some off tonight. And of course, the other part of the problem, really unreliable trash pickup. I mean, our trash pickup is Friday. This is Sunday. We'll see what day it's picked up this week. This but is unacceptable. We have put together a plan that says, number one, these private contractors are not going to do it anymore, that the city's going to do it. The great thing about that, and this feeds into the rest of it, is it's going to be cheaper for us to do it just because of the scale of economy. You're going to get right. the same high quality service that we get in the middle of the city, and there'll be enough money left over to help restart that bulky item pickup service that we used to have. We called in December set up a bulky item pickup for February. When they didn't show up, they said, oh, we don't have you on the list. It'll be August. We need more bulky item pickup regularly throughout the Absolutely. city. Absolutely. There's not this request-based system. I think dumpster days should be something that are a lot more frequent in every neighborhood. On the residential trash and recycling pickup, I mean, I think it was pretty obvious that we had a contractor who has uh, been underperforming significantly for a long time. Yeah. I know we've now voted at council to bring it in-house. There's your bulky yeah, there's discussion. Our bulky item. Right. <laughs> and see, yeah. no one's going to bring that back in after it's been outside for oh, a gosh, week no. and it's wet and could have critters in it. It's funny how quickly you see all the problems in a, just in one block, right? Right, you can see right. All the challenges and the things we need to do better. But on the trash, the one thing, while we bring it in-house, I want to make sure that we stay competitive and responsive too. Because what I don't want is a bureaucracy where you're all of a sudden saying, well, they're just as bad. The other thing that we need to do is I think have real performance metrics. And if we're not hitting it, there needs to be some real penalty to it. One of the other issues we really wanted to talk to you about while, while you're here is crime. We've got the drug houses here. I know that crime happens in every neighborhood, but I never see a police car in this neighborhood. Before I was on the city council, there was a big shift to take a lot of the civilian jobs and have uniformed officers do those civilian jobs. That doesn't make sense to me. If someone's trained as a uniformed officer, right. they need to be in the streets. Officers spend 80 to 90% of their day responding to calls and then they only have that tiny little fraction to do the work that we were just talking about. I don't think we have enough police right. resources up here. Right. You guys right. know this. We, know we have we a don't. huge right. area. Right, that's been the craziest thing. I've done three KCPD ride-alongs, mm -hmm. and I always ask them, I'm like, so what about the areas of the city that are under patrolled? And I think a lot of them said, yeah, we hope, we hope nothing too bad happens. I get bashed sometimes in the paper for this and all that sort of stuff, but they, people like to say the public safety budget is too high. But I'm like, no, well, you need to be safe. It was really interesting to do a ride along. That's something that would not normally happen to the average voter. One thing that I was impressed with with uh, Jolie Justice is I didn't know that she was previously a senator. Um, and I hate to admit that I didn't know that part of her territory sp uh, spanned into the Northland. I was expecting one of them to be probably snobbish or not care, and you didn't get that from either one. I like that Quentin Lucas. Um, offered up the fact that, you know, oh, call me or email me at any time. And we want that kind of closeness. I'm kind of teetering right now. I think I know who I'm going to vote for, but I still don't know yet. I have to weigh the pros and cons. All righty. Is that like you at home? You're still teetering? I'm still weighing up the pros and cons. We appreciate you doing the tour. And of course, this is a condensed version. You said so much more amazing things. And they talked about a lot of good things happening in their neighborhood. And we thank our neighborhood leaders. But you did make some promises. And let's start with you, Quintal Lucas. We've got to add more police officers. The budget could be bigger, even though most of the sure. budget right now is for public safety. What are you cutting from the budget? What service is no longer going to be provided to allow for all of these more police officers you're providing? 
I mean, I have lots of great cut ideas, like many of the consultants and lobbyists to the tunes of millions of dollars that we fund every year out of the city hall budget. Frankly, I think we should invest more in public safety instead of that. I think even when we look at the KCPD budget, there's more work we can do to make sure we're not duplicating certain costs and services that both the city is doing, let's say computing technology, for example, that the city is doing and KCPD is doing right across the street. But I do think foundationally and fundamentally, no matter your neighborhood, if you call 911, you want someone showing up within 20, at less than 20 minutes. You want someone there quickly, and we can't deliver that right now in every part of the city. Jolie Justice, you told the tour guides that too many officers are doing administrative jobs that used to be done by civilians. How do you plan to change that system when we're one of the few police departments in the country controlled by a state body rather than the city itself? Right. So we have a local police board that is made up of four local people along with the mayor. But as you know, um, those four local people are appointed by the governor. And so one of the struggles that we have, obviously, is making sure that we can make policies that um, reflect what we have as, as priorities. And so the first thing I'll do as the uh, um, mayor, I will sit on that police board and I will start having, you know, those really, really tough conversations about moving resources. You know, right now we have a lot of redundancies between the police department and city hall, and we can start combining those things. And so moving forward, establishing policies and budget priorities that reflect the priorities that we've all talked about on the campaign trail. And that means we're also going to have to work with our city council members to do that. Because at the end of the day, you have to get to seven votes and you have to get the confidence of the council to move these ideas forward as well. Um, I think another thing that is critically important as well is that I do have a relationship with Jefferson City, and that is important because I can f reach out to the governor and I can say, you know what, these are the type of people that we need on our police board so that we can be making these tough decisions. The future of our city rests in the hands of our young people, and I'm thrilled we have many of them with us today, including Gibson Miller, who is with Debate KC. Welcome. What is your question for the candidates? Do you support providing more city services and help to migrant laborers and undocumented workers? More than 200 cities limit cooperation with immigrant author immigration authorities. These are called sanctuary cities. Would Kansas City become one if you were to become mayor? Quinton Lucas. You know, I think the first thing uh, to answer your question is absolutely we need to give more help and assistance to migrant workers. Absolutely we need to make sure that we're providing more access. I think, and I've, I've said this for, for months now and ages, municipal ID cards for folks that may be undocumented, frankly for anyone, because the state, Jefferson City, continues to make it harder not just for undocumented folks to live here, but largely for everyone. I think in terms of the sanctuary city conversation, the state has uh, preempted, which means kept us from saying we will declare ourselves one, but what that doesn't mean is that we can't actually do a few key steps to make life for people easier. One, making sure KCPD is working with communities, not just working with ICE to get folks out. I think the second and important step is that we're hiring a more diverse and well-trained police department that's working with communities, like our Somali population in Kansas City, like our Latino and uh, Latina population in Kansas City. <laughs> there is so much more work we can do to make sure people are welcome here instead of excluding them. How would your approach be different, Jolie Justice? You know, one of the things that has been very difficult for me as someone who provides free legal services throughout our community is the distrust between the migrant and immigrant population with our city officials, with our County officials. I have been doing, as I mentioned, free legal services for the last 16 years, and I represent folks who are here undocumented. And one of the things that is very frustrating to me is I could have a victim of domestic violence, and she will not go with me to the courthouse to get a protective order for fear that she's going to be deported. And so as a member of the police board, one of the things that I'll be doing is making sure that the priority of our police department will remain what it is now, which is keeping us all safe and not enforcing federal laws that do not reflect this community. That's one of the things. But also, we have to really, really make sure we're providing the resources to have every community thrive. There are other cities that are getting it right, sanctuary city or not, and I want to follow those best practices to make sure that we have a city that is inclusive, where everybody can succeed. Next, let's check in with Deborah Pace. Deborah, I met at Costco, just but right next to the cereal aisle, and who came at me with a huge list of concerns about what was going wrong with the city. And I thought, well, let's go one step better and have you ask a question to the candidates. What, would you mind standing for us, Deborah? Thank you very much indeed. What was your question? What was your biggest concern? My question for both of y'all is the potholes in the third and the fifth district. 
they are bigger than the four oceans. <laughs> I thought they were supposed to be fixed. That's what they claimed they were fixed. Back in January, I mean February, they said that they was going to start in War Parkway. And so a couple of my relatives have cars. So one sister of mine, her car, her alignment fell up from under the car because of the potholes on Purcell or Cleveland. And, you know, if you're driving up and down the 3rd and 5th districts, the, the potholes, like I said, is bigger than the four oceans. Okay, well, let's get a response from them. Thank you very much. What are you doing about that, and why hasn't it already been fixed, Julie Justice? You know, one of the things that we're doing right now is, is filling the potholes as fast as we can, but that's not good enough. That's not good enough because the reality is we have over 6,000 lane miles of roads in this city. And as soon as we get those potholes filled, new ones form elsewhere. And so one of the things that we need to make sure we're doing that we're not getting right right now is more high level vision and planning. We need to make sure that we are not only holding the city accountable to fill those potholes, but that long term we're making decisions that are going to result in fewer potholes in the future. And that's not going to be easy work. That's going to make sure that we're going to have to start doing things like um, eliminating duplication of services between all the different departments. Right now, we have people in parks, in public works, in planning, in water, all over the city working on these issues. It's time to combine those and make sure we're all working in the same direction so that we don't just run around filling potholes, but that we're actually doing things proactively to prevent them in the future. There is one PR press release after another saying we are fixing them. We're doing 3,000 this week, 4,000 last week. Why is this still a problem? Them, Quentin Lucas? Because we didn't remember that winter still existed. I mean, here's the problem. The great pothole crisis of 2019 actually shouldn't have been a surprise, right? We should have been predicting. We should actually plan ahead. And my view isn't that we have more bureaucracy or more departments. My view is simply that we require the Department of Public Works like today, to say, what's your plan for next winter? How are you showing us that you're preemptively resurfacing streets, reconstructing streets? I mean, all of you have already increased taxes to actually pay for these. And in that tax increase, we said we were going to fix existing infrastructure. Then what did we start doing? The city almost immediately started building new roads in other parts of the city. I'm going to be someone who makes sure we hold on to our promise, addressing existing infrastructure and making sure we don't have these issues. And the problem is, you know, they're, they're bad in the third and Fifth, but they're kind of bad everywhere in Kansas City. We need to make sure we address this problem, and the way we do it is making our departments uh, be held to accountable starting now, not just waiting until next winter. Let's hear from some more of our young people who have taken the time to be with us. James Chanel has a question for us. James, thank you for being here. I represent Debate Kansas City. My question for both of you would be, how would you both plan to bridge the gap between Kansas City's current successes downtown with the need for more equitable development on our east side? Thank you very much, James. Let's start with Quinton Lucas on that. Outstanding question. Um, and I think that's key. Frankly, that has been the story of my life. Uh, I grew up knowing homelessness on the east side of Kansas City. Uh, I went to school in southwest Kansas City. Uh, and I came right back to East KC. Because one thing I think we need are leaders who understand the divisions and separations in our community, and leaders who can walk into any room in the city and say that we need to be equitable, we need to be diverse, and every policy we have, every conversation, be it relating to streetcar or housing or all of that, needs to really be about, actually, how can we help the poorest people in our city every step of the way? And so a few key steps that I've been interested in. One is when we talk about economic incentives, we have to think about how are we using the tools in the places where they're needed the most. Economic development can't just be a big home run project, downtown, plaza, crossroads conversation. We should get entirely out of the luxury subsidy for hotel hotel business entirely. We should really get out of the luxury multifamily housing subsidy entirely. And what we should be working on is how can we incentivize things like rehab of homes on the east side of Kansas City? How can we incentivize small business growth in poorer and older neighborhoods of Kansas City? And those actually aren't just east. Those are in South Kansas City. Those are in Southern Clay County. That's the work I've been doing on council for the last four years. That's the work I'm going to continue to do. How would you be different, Jody Justice? 
You know, one of the things that's really exciting right now in Kansas City is that we are seeing some of this happening, but it's only in pockets. And so that's why I'm running this Neighborhoods First agenda, because I want to make sure that we are bringing City Hall to the neighborhoods so that neighborhood leaders and people who are living in neighborhoods can help create that community in a way that works for everybody. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, we've got to be focusing on preserving our existing housing stock. One of the problems that we've seen is that we have over 9,000 vacant and abandoned properties. That's why I have worked with Jefferson City, both as a state senator and as a city council person working with our legislative delegation to pass laws to allow us to clean up those vacant and abandoned properties and to go after properties that are nuisance problems and to put things in place to help protect people against out of town and out of state landlords who are not doing their job and homeowners. So those are very specific things. And then what you do is you make sure that you are doing focused economic development, that it is around housing, that it's around small businesses and jobs, that we are really focusing on the things that are going to stabilize neighborhoods. I had someone ask me once, what are you going to make as a priority when it comes to east side or, or south side or, or you know, southern Clay County you know, neighborhoods? And they said, would you consider doing it around schools first? I said, that's a great idea. Let's work with our community to find out what the most important needs are, and then let's start doing that focused development so that that success we felt in pockets of the city is finally bridged. We'll get more questions from our citizens in just a moment, but to get to know you both better, we invited you to share with us a single photograph that you think best helps us understand who you are and what your campaign is about. Before we see what you've chosen, a quick trip down memory lane when we asked Sly James to pick a photo during his debate with Mike Burke eight years ago. Sly James, you selected this photo. Why? Well, that's a picture of me in high school at Bishop Hogan High School. You can see that there are stark differences between me and the surrounding individuals. I found myself in a uh, totally different racial environment, and I had to adapt. I wound up being a leader in that group and a leader in my school, and that was by finding a way to work together with those, with those folks in the school. All right, that was Sly James eight years ago. Quinton Lucas, now it's your turn. What image? best exemplifies what you stand for and what this campaign is about for you? You know, uh, it's an image of, of my background. I think often I like to talk about where I came from. I like to talk about, um, you know, why these issues are so passionate to me. And the person who trained me, who taught me everything, was my mother, who's here tonight. And she's a single woman. She raised three children on her own. We caught the bus every day. She worked her tail off. She still lives in the Parade Park neighborhood. She still struggles. But to me, this is the story of a community and people that work hard every day and who taught me about the value of education, who taught me about the fact that I can be anything. Because people didn't tell her that when she was growing up. And I thank her for that. And I'm proud of so many hardworking mothers in our city each day who do that. Julie Justice, we gave you the same opportunity, and you picked this image. Why? You know, one of the things that I have done when I was um, weighing way back in uh, 2006 about whether I was going to get involved in public service was um, I really looked back and thought, you know what, everything that I've done as a, a public servant is because I've been in the community trying to solve problems at the ground level, not in the state house, not in uh, city hall, but at the ground level. And so many of you have heard me say that I actually took the time in this race to walk across the entire city, and I did. I started at 163rd in Prospect. I walked all the way across the city and ended up at 144th and Inner Urban Road north of the airport. And the picture that I chose is one um, about halfway along the way. We were in South Kansas City there, you can see. It wasn't halfway along the way, but I had just actually fallen down a hill. I was covered in Mud. You couldn't see it in the photo there, but you I was didn't covered pick in that mud. One. Okay. Um, I, I chose that photo because I was covered in mud, <laughs> and um, I thought, you know what? This exemplifies what I do. I go into the community, I identify problems, and sometimes I fall down muddy hills and I get dirty. But guess what? I get back up. I keep moving forward, and I make sure that I implement policies that improve the lives of Kansas Cityans. And so I was proud of that photo because it just kind of showed kind of the collective work that I've been doing over the last 20 years. Now, being mayor is a lot more about doing different things uh, beyond answering questions about why you haven't fixed potholes or cleared the streets of snow. You have to appear at all sorts of events, sometimes showing hidden talents. Here's current mayor Sly James just a few weeks ago at our celebration at the station. Amazing grace, how sweet. Me. 
So having hidden talents can help. What's yours? Will Mayor Lucas or Mayor Justice be belting out tunes, perhaps playing out an instrument in the orchestra, tap dancing across the stage, or D, something completely different, Quinton Lucas? Yeah, I ain't gonna see me singing. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right. Right. Uh, you know, a little, a little secret thing I've gotten into lately, and it's a shame because I can't really swim, so I'm going to work on that. But uh, I like kayaking, and I've been getting more into kayaking in the Missouri River and that sort of thing. And uh, so you may see me out there on the river sometime. Just wave back. Jolly Justice, would we have seen you singing on the stage, tap dancing? It would not have been called a celebration had I been <laughs> okay, singing. Right, I, right, I will right. tell you that. I have, on multiple occasions, say, if you need spoken word, my background is in radio, and I'm more than happy to do that, but it will not be singing. What talents do I have? Well, one of the things that um, really brings me joy is gardening. And I mean vegetable and food gardening. And so what you'll expect to see from me in Kansas City is out there in all of our community gardens helping to grow this city, because that's something I'm actually very good at. All righty. Well, you also have to deal with real nitty gritty issues, which Tim Bond has for us too, because he has concerns. Tim is a former city employee living north of the river. Yes. Um, my question is, uh, how can the city of Kansas City, Missouri, help the elderly who are living on fixed income uh, meet their daily needs? Jolie Justice. That is a fantastic question. And one of the things that's really critically important to me is making sure that our seniors can age in place. And, and the reason that it's important is not just because I want seniors to stay connected and vibrant in their own communities, but all of our communities are healthier when our seniors are our neighbors and are our friends and working as part of, of everyday life. And so a few things. Number one, when we're focusing on incentives for development, I want to make sure we're focusing and, and have senior housing opportunities available. I'm also incredibly incredibly excited about the number of nonprofits in town who have come to me and talked to me about the things that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis to provide funding, to provide assistance, to help homeowners and people who are renting be able to stay in their homes. That's something that we can do as a city, provide funding as well. And so you'll see from me a very concerted effort to make sure that we do that and that we also have transportation and walkability so that seniors can really move around the city in a way that, that is very, very very substantive and helps everybody feel at home. Would you do something differently, Quentin Lucas? You know, a few things differently. I think the first thing we need to do is make sure that we uh, take care of some of the costs that make life for seniors and all of us more expensive. Water rate increases are a significant problem for our city, and lots of folks, particularly senior citizens, have told me, I can't afford this rapid rate of increase. We need to renegotiate that. In addition, what we need to make sure we're doing is looking at recreational activities for senior citizens as well. It isn't just a youth summer activity type thing in so many of our community centers. We need to continue to offer more classes, activities, etc. And then one other point is actually how are we stabilizing neighborhoods? That is the home rehab I've talked about. That is preserving, making sure that we have neighborhoods that are staying strong for years to come and not demolishing when we don't need to. But the question we heard more about than anything else from our viewers this week was the eye-popping, and it was from seniors on fixed incomes, the eye-popping property appraisals. <laughs> and they think they can't stay in their homes. They are so huge. But is that a county issue only, or does the city play a role in that too, Quinton Lucas? You know, we are uh, electing a leader, and I think a leader for the whole region, whether you're in the city, whether you're in the county, whether you're in another state. So while the county assesses, uh, and the county has issued these assessments, and for those of you uh, in Jackson County, make sure you get your appeals in in time, I believe until July 8th. Uh, I think it is important for us to have a conversation with the county assessor, the county executive, and the legislature about how they can make sure there aren't these radical changes from one year to the next in appraisals. That's the issue that's upsetting people this week. Is that a role, though, for the mayor to be involved in? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, this council has already already instructed our city manager to have conversations with the county executive to talk about the idea of capping property taxes for seniors on fixed incomes. It's something that I worked on as a state senator. It's something that we can do as leaders. We need to be having those conversations because our city is not going to thrive if we are pricing people out and if seniors are not able to age in place. And so I'm gonna be working with the AARP. I'm gonna be working with all of the county executives to make sure that we're doing that. Quinton Lucas, you said being the mayor is above, not just in the city limits, you have jurisdictions elsewhere or at least a bully pulpit for that. And in many respects, as the largest city in our region, you are the mayor of the metro if you're elected. 
Uh, is there a number one priority issue, problem or project you'd want to work on with the men and women who call themselves the mayor of Leewood, Lee Summit, Overland Park, or Blue Springs, Kansas City, Kansas, if you become mayor, Jolie Justice? Transportation. I have said very frequently that one of the things that this city is missing is a connected city. Getting people to and from jobs, getting people to and from work, and, and, and educational opportunities. And so one of the very first things that I would do as a regional conversation is working with those mayors to make sure that everybody in our community is a 15 minute wait from public transit, and that those who don't use public transit have walkability, bikeability, and other forms of safe streets to keep this city moving forward. Quentin Lucas. For me, the key issue is education. Education. And whether you have a child or whether you don't, I don't have a child myself, but it is something that I care so much about. People make business decisions, moving decisions based on schools, based on school quality, based on training programs for adults. We need to make sure we have a key regional conversation about how we can educate folks, how we can train a, a talented workforce, and how we can make that available in every part of our region. Let's hear again from our citizens. We're going to go over to Mike Wood with your question, Mike. Thank you, Nick. Um, after a couple of days, one of you is going to emerge victorious after a hard-fought fight. I'd like to know specifically what you as winner would do to collaborate and reach out to your opponent. Similarly, if you lose, what would you do to reach out and collaborate for the success of the city to work with your former opponent? Quinton Lucas, thank you. You know, as I think I've said a few times, I respect and have actually known Councilman Justice for a number of years, uh, initially from her pro bono legal work. I think uh, her relationships with law firms, I think her understanding of our particularly juvenile court system is outstanding. And as we uh, try to reach out to more young people, as we discussed before, figuring out how we can work with children and families to make our city safer each day is something that I would call on her for if she's so willing uh, from the time of my service as mayor. Jolie Justice. You know, I absolutely agree that one of the things that has been so critical in this city is that we have elections, the election ends, and then you see oftentimes both candidates still giving back to the community. And so know this, that if I win, I'll be reaching out to Councilman Lucas to ask for his assistance on the issues that are important to him and the issues where we can really keep the city moving forward. If I don't win, I'll reach out to Councilman Lucas and say, here are some ideas that I think would help. How can I make sure you're getting these things accomplished? Neither one of us ran for this because um, we really love being you know, yelled at every night of the week. Um, we ran because we want this city to be a better place. And so you can guarantee that I'll be reaching out, win or lose, to make sure that we keep the city moving forward. Let's head back to our citizens. Leanne Loesch is a performing arts teacher and debate uh, coach. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having us today. If you are elected mayor, will you keep the current city manager or will you be reevaluating the position? Jolie Justice. I have an incredible working relationship with Troy Schulte, and, and I will be um, working hard to keep Troy. Now, as everybody knows, um, these are uh, his his, um, his contract is up in 2020. So one of the things we'll have to do is make sure that the council puts together a contract that is good for him and good for the city. But I will be working very hard to make sure that he stays. Quinta Lucas. You know, I look forward to continuing to work with the city manager, and I would hope after uh, being successful, we have a chance not just to talk about how we can work together, but how we can get all of these things we discussed today done. We need to make sure we're addressing the housing issues. We need to make sure we're funding that housing trust fund. We need to make sure we're coming up with plans on how to fix our roads and make sure we're getting them done before next winter. So I really want to hit the ground running, and I think that's with our current city manager. Now, at the same time, voters are going to be going to the polls on Tuesday, starting at 6 o'clock, to vote for you. Uh, they're also going to be looking at a question called Question 1, which by and large basically limits tax incentives in Kansas City, more specifically... Uh, capping property tax abatements for developers at 50%. Will you be telling your supporters they need to vote yes on that, Quinton Lucas? I will not be telling them that they need to vote Why? yes. Why? You know, I don't support that tax increase, but I certainly know where they're coming from. Uh, I'm sorry, the tax proposal. Uh, and, and here's why. We have overused incentives. I talked about luxury hotels, luxury condominiums, those sorts of projects, and, and lots of parking garages around the city. I don't think that this is the right way to do it. One of the reasons is because it doesn't exempt good development in truly blighted parts of the, of the city. We need to make sure we can continue to do development where it's needed. Let's say on 27th and Van Brunt. But we don't need to actually have tax incentives, yet another one for another hotel in the crossroads. I think there's a balance. It's a balance I've been able to strike, by the way, over the years with an ordinance the cap them at 75%, known as the Lucas Ordinance. 
Jolie Justice. I am not supporting question one, and the reason is that I want to make sure the tools are available so that as we start moving our economic development into the neighborhoods that need it most, that we have every tool available in order to do really big things and also focused economic development in our most distressed neighborhoods. If we cap this and take that off the table, we're going to lose out on opportunities to develop in our most critical need areas, and so I can't support question one. Congratulations, Jolie Justice. You've just been elected mayor of Kansas City. If we are now right here and you've spent the first 100 days in office, what would you like to be telling everyone here that you've actually achieved in that first 100 days? You know, I'm running on what I call the neighborhood's first agenda because I want to bring City Hall to you. It is very, very difficult for you to get a hold of anyone at City Hall. Oftentimes you call six different places and you get six different answers. And so one of the things that I have proposed and I want it in place within that first chunk of time is making sure that we have regular meetings in your neighborhoods that have not just you know, city directors, but also have the city manager and me as the mayor and your council members. And we hold them at times that you can attend and we provide food and we provide free childcare services so that you can actually come and be a participant. I want to make sure that at that first, what did you say, 90, 100 days? 100 days, 100 yes. days that we have done that, that we have brought City Hall to your neighborhood. And in that 100 days, what would Quinton Lucas be able to tell this audience he'd achieved? That we have a safer city. You know, there is nothing to me that's more important than making sure we don't have more tragedies like the one we discussed earlier. And so what I want to be able to say in the first 100 days is we have taken clear, concrete steps to make our citizens, to make our city safer, and to make it a place where young people can grow up without feeling the fear of gun violence, and where folks of all ages can walk around safely in their neighborhoods. That's my first 100-day agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your hands together for our candidates. We have been joined this hour by the next mayor of Kansas City, Missouri. The only problem is we don't know which one. Will it be Team Lucas or Justice League? I hope our last 60 minutes together has helped you make a better decision. Whatever you do, don't let the pollsters, the consultants, or the media try to convince you they know the result. Only you will decide when you cast your ballot starting at 6 a.m. on Tuesday. From everyone here at KCPT, I'm Nick Haynes. Thanks for watching. This program was funded in part by the Health Forward Foundation. Additional community support comes from the law firm of Hush Blackwell, the AARP, and Bob and Marlise Gorley.